This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. Well, we're over here tonight in this building because we're going to have a PowerPoint presentation. It won't be a video, uh, but it'll be similar to the PowerPoint presentation I did this past year when we were talking about Mystery Babylon uh, from Revelation chapter 17 and 18. And uh, so in just a moment, I'll pull that up. But before I do, I want to introduce the topic for tonight by saying that it is another installment in that series on Mystery Babylon. And there are probably at least one, maybe two other uh, parts to that series on Mystery Babylon that I hope to do at some point, but I want to make sure that I uh, wait until I've had adequate time to do the research I want into several things that I'm not up to par on. Um, and that's one of the reasons that it has been so long uh, since we've talked about Mystery Babylon between then and tonight. But the subject that tonight's presentation deals with, you're going to see and hear some of the same symbols, the same uh, belief system that we talked about with the religion of ancient Babel and Babylon and the ancient mystery religions you're going to see and hear some of the same things, but in a modern setting. I want to say also at the outset tonight that probably every person here knows someone who is directly or indirectly a part of or participates in what we're going to talk about tonight. So I want to say this. I have personally known a number of individuals in my life who were associated with what we're going to talk about tonight. Most of whom I genuinely believe were saved and love the Lord. However, I don't think they knew most of what we're going to talk about tonight. In fact, I would dare say they probably did not know any of the things we're going to talk about tonight. And so, of course, it's my hope as pastor that uh, those that are here and those that will be listening later on on the recording is that um, we will understand what the Bible says about the subject so that you and I would not get caught up in something that's unbiblical or anti-biblical. But keep in mind that if you know someone who is participating in it, don't necessarily write them off as though they're heathen, unsaved, and uh, don't love the Lord. That's probably not the case at all. In fact, they probably do love the Lord. Um, and they probably just don't know the things that we're going to talk about tonight. I will also say that of those that I have known that have participated in what the presentation is about tonight... When I or other people have talked to them and tried to present to them the material that I'm going to present tonight, I have not seen in my experience that there's been a very good reception to hearing these things. So the best way to prevent this in your life is to know ahead of time and not get caught up in it. But if you know someone who is, perhaps use love and wisdom and discernment in sharing the things that we're going to talk about tonight. When I was a boy growing up, as most of you know, I did not grow up in an independent Baptist church when I was little. I was a teenager when I started attending an independent Baptist church, which for the most part, independent Baptist churches are what Southern Baptist churches were 75 years ago. Usually, independent Baptist churches are more traditional, more conservative, and more geared towards a literal interpretation of the Bible than most Southern Baptist churches have become. However, in that little Southern Baptist church where I grew up, I can remember one, one particular Sunday. I have no idea what the situation is that was going on in the church. I suspect 
they were about to choose a new deacon, but I don't recall that. But I remember the preacher saying from the pulpit one Sunday morning when I was, couldn't have been any more than about eight years old, he said there are two things that our church constitution and bylaws prohibit anyone who is an officer in our Baptist church from participating in. One is selling alcohol on, uh, selling alcohol, period. He said, People that own their own businesses, um, uh, they, they can sell it, but if they are um, an officer in the church, a pastor or a deacon, they are not permitted to sell alcohol. Because, of course, the Bible uh, says that we're not to give strong drink to our neighbor. So that was the one prohibition in the church constitution and bylaws. By the way, it was that way in all Southern Baptist churches back then, though it probably has changed somewhat today. The other prohibition, though, was that you could not be a, uh, the pastor or a deacon of that church if you were also a member of any secret society or fraternal brotherhood that had a secret membership. Of course, everyone, I suppose, back then knew what the preacher was talking about. He was talking about the subject that we're going to talk about um, this evening. And as soon as my machine works, we'll pull it up. Mystery Babylon, Freemasonry. I won't ask for a raising of hands, but probably when you hear the word Masons or Freemasons, you probably, if you're old enough to know very many adults, you probably know somebody or another that is or has been a Mason. I want you to remember the things that I said earlier uh, as we go through the presentation this evening, because my purpose is not to throw stones at anyone or question anyone's salvation. But you ought to know what the Bible says and how it lines up with Scripture. So, if I can uh, remember how to do this, we'll give it a start. When we studied Mystery Babylon in our verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Revelation this past year, we read the passage in Revelation 17 where it talks about Mystery Babylon. And of course, Mystery Babylon is the one world system of the Antichrist during the tribulation period. It's the one world religion, the one world government and economic system that is to come in the tribulation period. Much of what I'm going to cover tonight is material that we talked about in much more depth this past year when we studied Mystery Babylon before. I will not try to go back and rehash everything we talked about because that study by itself was six or seven presentations long. But you can go back and you can find those on the church's website if you want to re-listen to any of those or if you missed one. But we're just going to kind of do an overview to bring us up to the point I'd like us to be this evening. Mystery Babylon, Revelation 17 says this, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Again, remember, the admiration does not mean that he uh, thought it was wonderful, but rather he couldn't believe what he was seeing, is what John is telling us here. Uh, the picture that's on the right there is uh, one that I... Uh, stole from the internet. It's a famous painting of Europa, 
the goddess of Europe, but you see that Europa has, for centuries, been associated with a description that is very similar to what we see in Revelation 17 of Mystery Babylon. The woman seated on the beast, although it's not scarlet colored in this particular picture, uh, riding upon many waters. We know from the things we talked about this past year that everything that is going on in Europe, the symbology with the Tower of Babel bringing people back together and with the, the postage stamp of Europa by the European Union, their goal is to bring back together what <clears throat> fell apart with the fall of the Roman Empire. You know how that goes hand in hand with what the scriptures teach about what is similar to a revived Roman Empire during the tribulation period. So all of those things that were part of the ancient religion of Babylon and the Tower of Babel are going to come back to the surface during the tribulation period under the Antichrist. And Satan today is not waiting for the tribulation to get here. He is preparing the masses to accept the false religion that's coming with the Antichrist. We talked about Nimrod, who's mentioned in Genesis 10. It says, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, Even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. We talked about how Nimrod was the one who established the the kingdom of Babel, and later Babylon. And he, of course, along with his wife, Semiramis, are the ones that started the false religion at the Tower of Babel, before God had to confuse the languages, and scatter the people. I won't read all of this from Genesis chapter 11. You can go back and do that if you uh, want to later. But it's it's the story of the Tower of Babel and why God confused the languages. Because man was trying to elevate man above God and bring God down. That picture on the right is a famous painting of what is supposedly the Tower of Babel. I doubt that it looked a whole lot like the painting, but it's a very famous painting, and one that you will probably see often if you do any looking or studying on the Tower of Babel. We saw that when the people of the earth were forced to scatter, when God confounded the languages at the Tower of Babel, they scattered throughout the world, and everywhere they went, though, they took with them this false religion. You can find those symbols of uh, the religion of ancient Babel really in every part of the world, in ancient people's cultures, with the, the drawings, the paintings, the sculptures, uh, the carvings, the etchings. Anywhere around the world, you find the same symbols. Of course, the evolutionists are befuddled by this. How could all of these cultures all over the world, how could they all have these same common symbols? And yet you and I understand very clearly how that can be. It's because they all started at the Tower of Babel, and as they spread, they took with them this false religion everywhere that they went. Nimrod and his wife Semiramis and her child Tammuz, who was born after Nimrod's death, who she claimed was a reincarnation of her husband Nimrod. It's just a, a, a reinvention of this same religion in every culture. The same story, but they simply change the names from culture to culture. The worship of Nimrod as the exalted sun god. The worship of his wife Semiramis as the moon goddess and the virgin mother of their child that was born after his death, Tammuz, who is the supposedly reincarnated sun god born of the virgin on the night of the winter solstice which is the longest night of the year on the calendar you see over to the right 
some of the names in various cultures of ancient times. They have the same basic story with Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz, but they just have uh, different names ascribed to them in the different cultures. And uh, many of those names for Nimrod, you would recognize. The Israelites and the Canaanites uh, referred to him as Baal, the Phoenicians as El, Babylon, Bel or Belus, Assyria, Ninus, Greece, Zeus, Rome, Jupiter, the Egyptians, Ra, and on and on it goes. Same for Tammuz and same for Semiramis. By the way, a number of these names for Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz are mentioned in the Old Testament by name. Not just described, but the actual names are used. And uh, if you weren't here when we went through that study and looked at them in the Old Testament, um, I encourage you to do that when you have the opportunity online. Babel's religion was based on fertility. And the symbols are symbols that you would naturally associate with fertility. There are the obelisks. There are rabbits. Though That's an ancient carving statue of Semiramis from ancient times, long before there was ever an Easter bunny created in modern times. But the eggs and the rabbits were associated with fertility, and they were both associated with the worship of Semiramis, even in the, uh, the old times of ancient history. Here are some of the other symbols of Babel's religion. On the left, you see um, Semiramis is pictured, and if you notice, she's holding a scepter, and on top of the scepter, strangely, oddly enough, is what is the Star of David. It's a six-pointed star, and in other Babylonian carvings of ancient times, as well as carvings around the ancient world you find the Star of David going all the way back to ancient times before there was an Israel, before there were Jews, before God ever called Abram out of the land of Ur. Why? It's because what we've been told is the Star of David isn't the Star of David at all, but rather it was associated with the worship of Saturn. Saturn And the worship of Saturn was synonymous with the worship of the sun, Nimrod. You say, well, how could it be both the worship of the sun and the worship of Saturn at the same time? Saturn was viewed in the ancient pagan world as the nighttime equivalent of the sun during the day. So Saturn worship and sun worship both went hand in hand. They were both the worship of Nimrod, and ultimately, of course, Satan worship uh, through astrology. The other one that you see on the right there, again, you see not only Semiramis portrayed with the rabbit, but down in the corners, you also see owls, and we talked about how owls were also a symbol of the mystery religions. The religion spread as people scattered, In Egypt, the Egyptians carried on the false religion of Babel. Some of the symbols we find in Egypt that are linked to the mystery Babylon religion. There's the eye of Horus or the all-seeing eye. It's, of course, very prevalent in culture, in our culture today, in just about anything and everything associated with uh, Hollywood. You see the all-seeing eye frequently. Then there are the owls again. Then there are pine cones. Pine cones were supposed to portray the overhead view of the pineal gland inside the brain, in the center of the brain. Uh, I'll show another picture here. On the left is the uh, pineal gland. You see how when the brain is cut right down the middle, bisected, it looks almost identical to the all-seeing eye. This was known in ancient mystery religions as the third eye, or the ability to have intuitive knowledge that you did not gain through normal sources. 
the ability to know things that other people don't know. That esoteric knowledge or hidden knowledge that's associated with all of the mystery religions. Then, of course, the pyramids, the bulls of Apis or Nevis there in Egypt. And again, the bulls were associated with the worship of Satan as the horned god. The Israelites, when they left Egypt, as you know, they had been influenced by the Egyptians. And uh, while Moses was still up on top of Mount Sinai, before he even got down with the Ten Commandments the first time, they demanded of Aaron that he uh, make for them a, a golden calf to worship. Why? Because that's what they had seen the Egyptians worshiping before they left the land of Egypt. In fact, where the children of Israel lived in Egypt, in the land of Goshen, was right next to the city of Heliopolis, which was the capital of the worship of the prized bulls in Egypt. Those bulls and the worship of those bulls, the horned god, was associated with the worship of the sun god. The bulls were supposed to be the incarnation of the sun god, Ra. So, how did the children of Israel become associated with it? They picked it up from Egypt when they left there. On the right, you, uh, in the middle there, you see uh, again a portrayal of a statue of Moloch, who was also Baal, for whom there were child sacrifices made of infants. On the right hand side, you see what Stephen calls in the book of Acts the star of Remphan that he says the fathers of Israel worshipped in the wilderness. And um, so the star of Remphan, it's not something new. The star of David was around before there was a nation of Israel. Then we come all the way up to the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, the land that's referred to as the Holy Land, that includes Jerusalem, the land of Israel. It had, of course, been overrun by the Mohammedans, uh, also called the Muslims, Muslims. And so, during the Middle Ages, the Roman Catholic Church called for crusades for all the Catholics in Europe to go invade the Holy Land and retake Jerusalem and the Holy Land from the Mohammedans. <laughs> There was a special order that was founded by the Catholic Church. It was a military order. They were to be knights, and they were to protect the other crusaders and other Christian pilgrims making visits to Jerusalem. The Roman Catholic Order of the Knights Templar was founded on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem during the Crusades in 1119, during the middle of the Middle Ages. They returned to Europe after the Crusades were over, claiming to have learned secrets of black magic and alchemy through esoteric knowledge. Alchemy is supposedly the ability to change one substance into something else. Particularly, they claimed they had the secret of changing lead into gold. Their alchemy, however changing things from one form to another, was actually compounding interest on loans that they made to the kings of Europe, which moved gold to their coffers. The only changing of things that the Knights Templar were doing was moving gold from the coffers of the nations of Europe into their order's coffers by giving loans of money to kings when they would go to war and need extra money but then they would charge them an interest, a high interest, and a compounding interest that every year you not only had to pay interest on whatever you still owed, but on the interest that you still owed. So it just continued to snowball. That's how they became so wealthy. Eventually they became so wealthy and so powerful that the king of France and the pope together accused them of witchcraft and on a Friday the 13th, in 1307, in the middle of the night, the king of France had them all arrested and burned at the stake. That's where the Friday the 13th uh, terror comes from. 
A small group of the Knights Templar, though, were said to have escaped to Scotland outside of the Pope's power with much of the gold that they had accumulated. Now, the Knights Templar, those at least that escaped to Scotland, are said to have arrived in Scotland and created a new order, the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. The Templars who escaped to Scotland are said to have created this new order where they could hide in plain sight. They were still Knights Templar, but they couldn't call themselves Knights Templar because the Pope and the King of France and others would have had them hunted down and assassinated. There's a quote here from Albert Pike, who is considered the most prolific writer among Freemasons in the modern period, Listen to what he says about the Knights Templar. The end of the drama is well known and how Jack de Molay and his fellows perished in the flames. That is when they were burned at the stake. But before his execution, the chief of the doomed order organized and instituted what afterward came to be called the occult, the hermetic, or Scottish masonry. The order disappeared at once. Nevertheless, it lived under other names. So what Albert Pike, who is the foremost writer of modern-day Freemasons, is telling us is that the Knights Templar just simply created the order of the Scottish Rite in Freemasonry, but continued all their same rites and rituals and beliefs, but under a new name where they could do it out in the open without fear of reprisal. He calls it Scottish Masonry because there were other lodges of Masons in England and Great Britain at the time, but for the most part those were literally just um, organizations or what we may, maybe would call trade unions of actual Masons. Stone Masons, brick Masons, that kind of thing. It was related to the work they did. These Knights Templar, most of them were not actual Masons. They didn't work with stones, they didn't work with bricks, but they were creating a lodge of Masons, or that's what they were calling it, so that they could do it without being figured out. Just a few things about the history of Freemasonry before we get to the beliefs that compare or contrast with the Bible. In 1758, some of them apparently left Scotland, traveled to France, and established or organized a new lodge in France of the Scottish Rite with the same uh, rites and rituals that the Templars had left in Scotland. In 1759, the very next year, actually that should be 1859, I apologize, uh, the Scottish Rite was organized here in America. Somehow or another, the, the dates got changed. Those are not the right dates. That should be 1801, but my PowerPoint program apparently changed the dates when I went from one slide to the next. It just numbered the dates in order as though it was uh, had bullet points. Scottish Rite Lodges in America were started in 1801 in the South, and in 1815, they were started in the north. Albert Pike was elected as the sovereign grand commander of the southern jurisdiction in 1859, I believe. I'm thinking off the top of my head. And he continued to hold that position as the highest ranking Mason in the world until his death in 1891. In the 1870s, he wrote a book entitled Morals and Dogma, and a copy of this book was considered so important for Masons that it, uh, each of them were supposed to receive a copy of it when they became a Mason. And that lasted up until 1964 when uh, the public here in America began to question some of the anti-Christian contents in his book, Morals and Dogma. Morals and Dogma has been called the Bible of Freemasonry because it describes the, uh, the 
32 different degrees that people can receive as a mason in the Scottish Rite Lodges. But then came the Illuminati. You've heard of the Illuminati. You probably say, well, I know they're somehow associated with the Masons, but I'm not sure how. I don't know who they are really or what they believe. The Illuminati was founded by a fellow named Adam Bieshop in Bavaria on May the 1st, 1776. So there were a lot of important things happening in 1776. There was the American Declaration of Independence. There was also uh, Adam Smith who wrote The Wealth of Nations about capitalism. And then we have the founding of the Illuminati. Notice that it took place on May the 1st, 1776. That's the reason that May Day is celebrated every year on the 1st of May. Uh, It actually is celebrated mostly by communist countries. It's supposed to be a holiday for the workers of the world. But communism has its roots in Illuminism. Illuminism is what you would call the beliefs of the Illuminati. We don't know this for sure. No one has ever been able to document it. But it is widely believed that the Rothschild family were the ones that helped to fund Vieshop in creating the Illuminati. They are an anti-God family of bankers in Europe. But the Illuminati and Adam Vieshop sought to use the lodges of Freemasonry to spread his ideas of Illuminism. That is, he wanted to uh, worm his way into the Freemason lodges and then start spreading his ideas of Illuminism the Illuminati, through the Masonic Lodges, who at that time didn't believe the things that the Illuminati believes. Eventually, in 1784, some of the Illuminati writings were uncovered by the government of Bavaria, where he was doing his work, and the government of Bavaria kicked him out, and all the Illuminati members were kicked out and banished from ever returning to the kingdom of Bavaria. Many of them went to France. They went to France because that's where the Knights Templar had originally settled down after the Crusades and they thought there would still be some uh, amount of people that would be susceptible to their ideas, for lack of a better term. And they found, sure enough, one of the Masonic Lodges in Paris called the Grand Lodge of the Orient, which means the East, in Paris uh, welcomed them as members of as Masons, and that lodge of Freemasonry began to teach and believe things that Masonic lodges previous to this had not believed, had not taught. Those ideas, though, began to spread to other Masonic lodges. And Illuminism quickly began to spread not only to the other lodges of Freemasonry on that side of the Atlantic Ocean in France and England, but over to America as well. In fact, it was uh, such a problem that people in America, as well as in Europe, began to worry about the threat of Illuminism in their countries. George Washington had a fellow that sent him a book warning on the dangers of the Illuminati in 1798. And the fellow who sent him a copy of this book, that wasn't a book he had written, by the way, uh, wrote... Mr. Washington, a letter. Mr. Washington answered his letter on September the 25th, 1798. This is not the whole letter. These are excerpts. But George Washington said this, I have heard much of the nefarious and dangerous plan and doctrines of the Illuminati. Bet you didn't know the Illuminati was being talked about by George Washington in his day. But it was. It's been around for a while. He continues... The fact is, I preside over none, he's talking about Freemason lodges, nor have I been in one more than once or twice within the last 30 years. I believe notwithstanding that none of the lodges in this country are contaminated with the principles ascribed to the society of the Illuminati. There are a lot of Masons who want you to believe that George Washington was an avid Mason. And while he was a Mason, he says... By his own testimony, he had not even been to one of their lodges but once or twice in the last 30 years before he died. So he was not an active Mason. And 
even when he was in the Masons, it was before the beliefs of the Illuminati had come across the Atlantic Ocean and infected the Masonic lodges in America. He followed that up about a month later with another letter to the same gentleman as they were corresponding. Wouldn't that have been neat to get a letter from President George Washington? This fellow got two of them that I know of. He said in this letter, It was not my intention to doubt that the doctrines of the Illuminati and principles of Jacobinism, which is from the French Revolution, had not spread in the United States. On the contrary, no one is more truly satisfied of this fact than I am. So George Washington said, I know their views are already over here in America. I was not trying to give you the impression that I don't think their views are already infecting Americans. What he had said in his first letter is that he didn't go to Masonic Lodges enough to know that whether they were being the Masonic Lodges were being affected by the views of the Illuminati. I know, you're still wondering, okay, what do they believe? What's so wrong with it? And what's wrong with Freemasonry today if it doesn't line up with the Bible? Well, here are some of the symbols of Freemasonry today and in centuries gone by. You see there are going to be some of the same symbology that we saw associated with Mystery Babylon. That ought to be a good clue to us of what they probably believe. But we're going to examine what they actually say in just a few moments. First of all, you see the pyramid, and you see the all-seeing eye of Horus in the capstone of the pyramid above that. The all-seeing eye of Horus ought to immediately cause all of us that know better to think Mystery Babylon, the ancient pagan mystery religions of the ancient world. You see the square and compass The square and compass, of course, are tools of an actual mason who builds things. But for the masons, the square and compass were intended to portray, again, things related to fertility and reproduction, the male and female union. On the right, you see another symbol that's associated with Freemasonry called a point in a circle. We don't have time to go into all of the imagery that's associated with that, but all of those things are associated with sun worship and fertility, just like Mystery Babylon symbology. Here are three of the men that are regarded as probably the most well-known and widely read authors of modern Freemasonry. There's Albert Pike, who was a 33rd degree Freemason, the highest you can go. Albert Mackey, who was a 33rd degree and secretary general for the Scottish Rite Freemasons. And then a fellow named Manly P. Hall, who authored uh, some very strange books about paranormal things. But he, too, was a 33rd degree Mason and wrote much supporting their belief system and where it came from. We'll see some of that in a moment. The dangers of Freemasonry. As a pastor, these are the three things that I believe are the most dangerous things about a Christian being a member of the Masons. Number one, its purpose is to initiate influential members of society into the mystery religions through symbols and rituals. Do they understand that when they go through their Masonic rituals that those rituals they're going through and the symbology is tied back to ancient mystery Babel and Babylon, I'm sure most Masons don't know that. But that's what's happening. They're being initiated through those symbols. Last year when we did our study on mystery Babylon and the symbols that are in pop culture today from that, We talked briefly about the power of symbols on the subconscious mind that even if you don't know what the message is, your mind decodes symbols. So those who are Masons, every time they go to a Mason meeting, they're being initiated with these symbols of Mystery Babylon, whether they realize it or not. 
Number two, while masquerading as a philanthropic fellowship or a humanitarian organization, it is actually a religion which promotes universalism, works-based salvation, and a maligning or talking bad about the God of the Bible. You say, preacher, I know some Masons and none of them promote universalism. None of them believe that you get to heaven by your works and none of them talk bad about God other than maybe using an expletive now and then. Well, they may not realize that's what Freemasonry does, but if you read the writings of those who put together the different degrees of Freemasonry, we find out very quickly that is what it is. It's a religion. I can tell you I've had Masons tell me personally, it's not a religion. Friends, it is religion. You're about to see that for yourself from their own words. The words of Masons. The Masons in charge of Masonry. And not only is it a religion, it's a religion that leads people to hell. Not to the God of the Bible. Sorry about my tablet keeps... uh, going dark on me and I keep having to refresh it here. The God of Freemasonry, His name in Masonic lodges or the Masonic temple is referred to as Jobulon. Jobulon is taken from the names of three different ancient gods. Jah, supposedly from Jehovah. And the name Jah is used for our God in the Psalms on a couple of occasions. Bull, from the Canaanite god Baal. On, from the sun god Ra, who was worshipped in the Egyptian city Heliopolis. And the Egyptians didn't call it Heliopolis, the Greeks did. The Egyptians called it On. If you read in your Bible in the book of Genesis, when Joseph is there in the land of Egypt, you'll see that he married a daughter of the priest of On, which was the worship of the Egyptians where they worshiped the sun god. So it's mentioned in the Bible as well as Baal. You say, well, uh, preacher, that's, that's just you coming up with the name Jobulon, and that's you saying that's uh, where the name originates. I don't have time to read it right now because I'm going to be out of time here in just a moment. But Albert Pike himself, the one who wrote Morals and Dogma, the one who wrote the description for 32 of the 33 degrees of Freemasonry, is the one who said that's where the name came from. By combining the names of three different gods. And the Masons view all gods as being equal. You and I know that as a Christian, that can't be, and you can't believe that and worship the true God. Universalism. It's the belief that you can get to heaven through any God, through any religion. Listen to what Manly P. Hall, one of those three that we looked at a moment ago, look what he said. The true Mason is not creed bound. He realizes with the divine illuminate, he realizes with the divine illumination of his lodge that as a Mason, his religion must be universal. Christ, Buddha, or Muhammad. The name means little, for he recognizes only the light and not the bearer. In other words, the special knowledge that Christ, Buddha, Muhammad brought to the world. The knowledge. That's what they mean by light is knowledge. Knowledge that other people don't have. That's what they mean by light. So he's saying you can get to to God through Christ, Buddha, or Muhammad. He worships at every shrine, bows before every altar, whether in temple, mosque, pagoda, or cathedral, and realizes with his true understanding the oneness of all spiritual truths. No true mason can be narrow, for his lodge is the divine expression of all broadness. Folks, you can't get any clearer than that. 
Masonry teaches that all gods and all religions are equal. And they all lead to the same place. They do not. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, verse 6. Here's another in, uh, quote on universalism by Albert Mackey. One of those three. The interpretation of the symbols of Freemasonry from a Christian point of view is a theory adopted by some, but one which I think does not belong to the ancient system. The principles of Freemasonry preceded the advent or the start of Christianity. If Masonry were merely a Christian institution, the Jew, the Muslim, the Brahmin, and the Buddhist could not consistently partake of its illumination. But its universality is its boast. In its language, citizens of every nation may converse. At its altar, men of all religions may kneel. To its creed, disciples of every faith may subscribe. Folks, if there's a religion that all those people can get along with, go along with, it's obviously contrary to the Word of God. And it's contrary to our God, who is a jealous God. Here's another quote from another official uh, Masonic publication, the Masonic Kentucky Monitor. It says, All antiquity believed, that's ancient times, in a mediator or redeemer, by means of whom the evil principle was to overcome and the supreme deity reconciled to his creatures. The belief was general that he was to be born of a virgin and suffer a painful death. The Hindus called him Krishna, the Chinese Kyunse, the Persians Soshash, the Scandinavians Balder, the Christians Jesus, the Masons call him Hiram. He's saying that all religions are the same. Well, it's true that all those ancient pagan religions are the same, except the God of the Bible. There's a difference. They're not all the same. By the way, notice that the leaders of Freemasonry are saying Freemasonry is a religion. They're not obfuscating, trying to go around that and deny it. Freemasonry is also occultic, though. Now, the word occultic simply means hidden, but we as Christians, when we hear the word occultic, we normally associate it with satanic, witchcraft. And the truth is, it is associated with those things in this sense. Albert Mackey says the religion of Freemasonry is not Christian. He's not even trying to hide it. Although, if you talk to a Mason here in Georgia, I'll guarantee you they'll say, well, I'm a Christian. All the men in our lodge are Christians. It's a Christian organization. But that's only because they've only been to lodges where there were Christians. There are also Masonic lodges around the world that are Muslim lodges. There are Masonic lodges that are Buddhist lodges. There are Masonic lodges that are Jewish lodges. Lodges, And they all put their holy book out front in their lodges. Christianity is just one of many. Manly P. Hall says this, Man is God in the making. Well, that's the same thing that Satan, that's the same lie that Satan told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, wasn't it? Ye shall become gods. By the way, it's the same lie that the Mormons teach as well. And much of what goes on in the Mormon religion was stolen or borrowed from the Masons. Because Joseph Smith was a Mason, and when he started using some of the Masonic rituals in the Mormon church, the Masons said, hey, you've got to stop using our secret rituals and showing them to everybody. We don't like that. He kept doing it, and they put a bounty on his head, and were out to kill him. That's why he fled the state of New York to Nauvoo, Illinois, because they were going to kill him, the Masons were, for letting their secret rituals out. By the way, they take those rituals seriously and the oaths to keep them a secret. They were going to kill Joseph Smith. That's why he fled for his life. 
If you're not convinced that Freemasonry is occultic, listen to this quote from a member of the Supreme Council of 33rd Degree Mason. The signs, symbols, and inscriptions date from the Sumerian civilizations. That's back to the Tower of Babel. Chaldea, Babylon, Assyria, Greece, Rome, and even in Mexico and the Yucatan. Some rites of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry of our mother jurisdiction have been in existence from time immemorial. In other words, as far back as human history is recorded. By the way, we could say back to the Tower of Babel. For we teach the same grand truths, the same sublime philosophies as those adepts of the ancient mysteries taught in their esoteric or hidden rites. So he's saying the same thing that we say, that their beliefs go all the way back to the Tower of Babel. He, of course, is just saying that's a good thing. We're not. Here's another uh, 33rd degree Mason published by the Supreme Council. He says, It is the body of the Holy Spirit, the universal agent, the serpent devouring his own tail. Now, do you remember us looking at that symbol of a serpent devouring its own tail when we were looking at symbology of Mystery Babylon this past year? That's a symbol of Mystery Babylon It's a symbol of Satan, but it's not the Holy Spirit. That's something totally different. The Holy Spirit is not part of what he's associating with the serpent swallowing its tail. We said that they believe in a works-based salvation. Well, here's one example of proving that. Albert Mackey, again, one of the highest ranking masons and writers ever, says, by the apron which is what the Masons wear, a work apron, the Mason is reminded of the purity of life and rectitude of conduct, which are so essentially necessary to his gaining admission into the celestial lodge above, where the supreme architect of the universe presides. In other words, the way you live and what you do, your conduct determines whether you're going to heaven or not. Except instead of heaven, he calls it the celestial lodge. And instead of referring to God, he calls him the supreme architect of the universe. But here's where it starts getting a lot more interesting, and that's good because I'm about to be out of time for tonight. Freemasonry is Luciferian. That is, it is actual worship of Satan. And I know that if we had two Masons sitting here from right in our community, or 30 of them, they'd all say, no, it's not Luciferian. It's not Satanic. It's Christian. And yet when you read the writings of those who put together their rituals, you're about to see a very different picture. Those who say what their symbols mean, that they go through in their rituals, listen to what they say. Manly P. Hall, again, one of those top three writers or architects of modern Freemasonry said, when the Masons learned that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. By the way, it is a craft, but it's not stone craft. How many Masons do you know that are actual brick Masons or stone Masons? Maybe a few. Not most Masons. They're doctors, lawyers, judges, politicians, businessmen. But they're not involved in stone craft or brick craft. They're actually involved in practicing witchcraft. He continues, The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. And before he may step onwards and upwards he must prove his ability to properly apply this energy. They think Lucifer is the good guy. The word Lucifer, the name Lucifer, literally means light bearer. The one who bears light. It's a name that God gave to Lucifer when he was the anointed cherub that covereth, was there at the throne in heaven, 
praising God, leading the heavenly worship of God before he rebelled against God. What does the Bible say about Satan in the New Testament? He comes as an angel of light. Satan is scheming, cunning. He wants people to believe he has some special knowledge that they don't have. Mary? God kicked him out of heaven, didn't he? He has, and he currently is still able to go back and forth to heaven because he accuses the brethren, that is us, but there's coming a day that we read about in Revelation chapter 12, if I remember correctly, where he'll be permanently kicked out of heaven. But that time hasn't arrived yet. So, here's one quote remarking that Masons should look to Lucifer, but we're just getting warmed up here. I'm about finished, but the best quotes are yet to come. Albert Pike, who was speaking before his death to a group of Masons, said this. I'm going to read it because it's probably hard for you to make out from where you're at. I want you to know before I read this that some Masons, most Masons say he didn't really say this because it wasn't written down in a book. It was transcribed from a speech he gave. But whether you believe he said it or not, it certainly matches up with everything else we've seen from the Masons. And it's going to match up with something else we see from Albert Pike in a moment. The quote says, That which we must say to the world is that we worship a God, but it is the God that one adores without superstition. To you, sovereign grand inspectors general, we say this, that you may repeat it to the brethren of the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. In other words, don't tell it to the lower level Masons. This is just for the high ups to know. The Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates of the higher degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. If Lucifer were not God, would Adonai, who is the God of the Bible, and his priests calumniate him? In other words, if Lucifer wasn't God... Would the God of the Bible bother talking bad about him? He's saying because our God talks bad about Lucifer, Lucifer must be God. He says, yes, Lucifer is God. And unfortunately, Adonai of the Bible is also God. For the eternal law is that there is no light without shade, no beauty without ugliness, no white without black. For the absolute can only exist as two gods. Here's the dualism that you see in Hinduism, Buddhism, the yin-yang, the white and the black. The last part of the quote says, Thus the doctrine of Satanism is a heresy, and the true and pure philosophical religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai of the Bible. But Lucifer, God of light and God of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the God of darkness and evil. He calls our God the God of darkness and evil. He calls Lucifer the God of light and the God of good. And he says Lucifer is working for the benefit of mankind and the God of the Bible is against mankind. Now even if you don't believe he really said what we just read, there's no, there's no way to say he didn't write this because it's in his book, Morals and Dogma. You can read it for yourself online if you want to bother to look it up. The same man, Albert Pike, the highest ranking Mason in the world, said, Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. In other words, Christians are foolish for calling him the spirit of darkness. He calls him Lucifer, the son of the morning. It is he who bears the light, and with its splendors intolerable, blinds feeble, sensual or selfish souls. Doubt it not. In other words, he's saying, can Lucifer, the god of light, the angel of light, really be bad if he's the light bearer? He's saying, no, 
He's the good guy. That's my final slide for tonight. I didn't have time to cover the rest of what I have regarding what Masons believe in their own words and what the Bible says. If you all are interested at another time, we'll cover the rest of it. But anyone who wants to see should have been able to see enough tonight to see that it's something that a Christian has no business being a part of. I hope that you'll take all of this to heart. But remember, the Masons that you know undoubtedly do not know what you just learned. Use discernment. Use love and prayer if you're going to try to share this with them. Because you will encounter grave, grave resistance if you try to share with them what you just learned. Yes, sir? You answered the question I was going to ask you. How far along into this do you have to be before you hear and learn about this stuff? That would be up to the 30th degree before you hear any of this, right? Before you hear anything about Lucifer, yes. Yeah. The, I didn't have time to cover all my material, but one of the quotes from Albert Pike himself, the highest ranking Mason, is that the members of the Masons, as they go through the 33 degrees, we tell them in one degree what our symbols mean, and our rituals, but it's not what they really mean. We just have to tell them something. And they believe it. And then when they move up higher in the degrees, we tell them the true meaning of the symbols and the rituals. So he's admitting himself that lower level Masons are intentionally lied to about what their symbols mean. So when you talk to a Mason and they say, no, that's not what we believe at my lodge, he's simply echoing what he's been told. But the higher-ups have already admitted we're lying to them until they get high enough, far enough along in their illumination, and then we present the real meaning. They the liar and the father of it. That's exactly right. Very well said. Any other questions? No questions. I'm very surprised. Any comments? All right. I will warn you if you try to share this that you just learned with Masons, any Mason that you know, they're going to deny it vehemently. Mainly because they don't know what you just heard. But also, even if you show them, they'll deny that it's true. Even in black and white. When they take an oath and join the Masons, they pledge their loyalty to the Masons. And that loyalty in their oaths is supposed to be above their loyalty to anyone or anything else. Sadly enough, I have known Masons who were more loyal to their lodge than their church. That's a sad situation. By the way, there are also... Masons at the higher levels that are more loyal to the Masons than they are to America as well. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for a chance to study another portion of this study on Mystery Babylon. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. Help us to understand and see the truth for ourselves in the light of Scripture and a purpose in our hearts not to partake in anything ourselves that's not of You. For those that we love, help us to lovingly and with compassion try to bring them out of the darkness that they believe is light. I pray You'd help us to be what You want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.